I did everything according to the description, but my device does not work. The device stopped working and I swear I did not do anything wrong. I tried everything and it does not work. Never encountered these sentences? Or you are always able to deal with these situations in a fast way? Then it's time to move on to the next video. For all others, we will discuss a few rules for finding errors faster. And I'm pretty sure you did not learn them at school or even not at your university. And if you learned them, a repetition could be a good thing. Ritchie YouTubers, here is the guy with the Swiss accent, with a new episode around sensors and microcontrollers. This episode might sound a little odd, but I often get requests for help because something does not work. This seems to be the most common problem for makers. After this episode, it should be easier and faster for you to find issues or problems. Only if you find the root cause, you can make your devices run correctly. Otherwise, the defect will return. And if it takes too long to find an error, it is not rewarding and boring. So let's start with rule number one. Ask the following question if something is wrong with your device. Did it work before as expected? Sounds trivial. I was head of a support organization and I can assure you, not asking this question cost us lots of money. Why is this question so important? Let's assume your car, when you bought it, had a top speed of 160 kilometers or 100 miles per hour. And suddenly it only runs half the speed. What would be the answer to this question? Yes, it worked before as expected and suddenly stopped working correctly. I call this case A. Who is best to solve this issue? Yes, of course, the repairman in your preferred garage. This guy is trained to find issues, maybe has some automated diagnostic tools to help the search for defective parts and exchange it for a spare part. His chance to succeed is nearly 100%. The speed of the repair is usually quite fast. Let's assume your car only ran 80 kilometers or 50 miles per hour when you bought it. And now you are no more happy with this top speed. What would be your answer to the question now? No, it never ran 160. But now I'm more experienced and I wish it runs 160. I call this case B. Would you bring this case to the repairman? No, because his diagnostic tools would not help and replacing parts with spare parts would also not help because they are not made to improve speed. You need a person able to tune the engine to double or triple the power. This guy would then enhance the design of the engine, the suspension, would reduce wind resistance by adding or replacing parts for better ones and do some testing using sophisticated instruments till he gets the desired effect. Usually this guy also has specialized training, maybe even a degree in automotive engineering. The chance for him to succeed is less than 100%. And the time he needs for such an improvement usually is much longer. And the cost is also quite high. I hope you see now why asking this question at the beginning is so important. You can rightly argue that my arguments were wrong because you can buy ready-made tuning parts which just have to be exchanged with the ordinary ones to get the job done. If this is the case, the answer to our question would have been no, mine did never run 160, but I know that the same car runs 160 in many other places and it is well documented how to get it to this speed. What would be your answer to question number one with your knowledge? Still case B, but we can extend our diagram with a second, slightly different question. Did it work somewhere else? And now we're able to avoid case B and treat our issue as a case A, which can be handled similarly to a repair. 
which can be solved fast and cheap. Cool, we have to keep this in mind for later. You see, the simple question decided who is the right guy, which methods he has to use, which skill sets is necessary, the cost and also the chance to succeed. Now an actual case I encounter every week a few times. Let's assume you followed the instructions of one of my videos and your device does not work. How would you answer question number one? No, it never ran at my place, but it ran in the lab of Andreas. And I used his instruction to build mine. Undoubtedly case A, a repair. And you have to behave like a repairman, not like an engineer or maker unless you changed the code or added some features without testing the initial setup provided by me. And how does a good repairman work? Successful repairmen always try to reduce complexity. To do that, we first have to understand what complexity is. Unfortunately, complexity has many different definitions. For our today's discussion, we do not need to define it. We only have to understand how it gets bigger. And if we know how to increase it, we also know how to reduce it. Complexity increases exponentially with the number of components and with the number of different interactions between these components. Now you understand why I call complexity a silent killer. If we start with one component, we have complexity one. If we add five interactions, we have a complexity of 5. Another component added and we have already complexity 10. Another 5 interaction possibilities and we have a complexity of 30. A new component and we are at complexity 45. And a last tiny interaction and we are at a complexity of 60. Think about that if your customer or your boss asks just for a small additional feature. Enough theory. Let us try a real life example. You build a device consisting of a DHT temperature sensor, an OLED and a WeMOS board. You followed the video, downloaded the library and the code and tried to upload it to your WeMOS board. It does not work. You did not change anything. You can now post a comment and ask me for general help. Andreas, it does not run. Please help. You can also start with rule number one. The answer is case A because you saw the same setup running in the video. And maybe in addition, you browse through the comments of the video and nobody else complains a malfunction. Another clear sign of a case A. What are the components of your system? A WeMOS board, an OLED, a sensor, the Arduino IDE, the library, the sketch, and your computer where the IDE runs. What are the interactions between the different components? A lot of interactions have to take place and the chance we ever will understand all of them is minimal. Repairman's rule number two is reduce complexity by reducing the number of components. Sometimes you have to go down to isolate only one component. In our case, a natural first division of components would be to separate the programming environment from our device. This split divides the setup into two parts with about an equal number of components. The first check will be if the sketch compiles and uploads to the WeMOS board. If it does not compile or upload, we have to search in the PC, the Arduino IDE, the sketch or the libraries. If it uploads, the error is somewhere in our device. Rule number six is only continue if all components tested so far work. Shortcuts here usually become detours later on. If the code does not compile, we search for an error in the sketch or the library. Maybe we reinstall the library or check if we selected the right board. If we tried everything and it still does not work, we have to reduce the complexity further by testing the Blink sketch. This is the lowest complexity possible in the Arduino IDE. If this works, we continue with examples of the libraries. Only if these examples compile, we can continue with our code. So you see, we increase 
complexity step by step. Of course, error messages can help direct you in the right direction, but sometimes they are not a big help. Let's assume you found and corrected the error and your code compiles now correctly. Only now we connect the WeMOS board and upload the code. Maybe you have to debug the upload process, usually by lowering the upload speed. If the upload does not work, disconnect the OLED and the sensor to reduce complexity. They could use a wrong pin, for example, or create a short. Let's assume the upload does not work and you tried everything we said before. Then again, rule number three comes into action and you replace the WeMOS board. This is why I usually buy at least two products from China, as rule number four suggests, to save me a lot of time. If also the second board does not upload, the chance you have a defective board is minimal. If this board uploads, you can continue with it and mark the first one as dubious. You test it later again under different circumstances. Now we have our sketch on our board and are quite sure that these parts work. Of course, if our sketch uploads without problems at the beginning, you can start debugging directly here. If disconnected, we connect the OLED and check if it displays anything. If not, we look at the code if we can expect something on the screen without the sensor working. If we can expect something to display and we do not see anything, we know the error is close to the display. If we cannot expect something to display, we add the necessary lines of code, usually in setup, to display hello world or something similar. This is rule number five. Reduce the number of possible interactions. <laughs> The sensor and its code is like the man with a sword. Sophisticated and complex. Our hello world is more like Indiana Jones. Simple but efficient. If it still does not display anything, we check the connection, rule number seven, and exchange the display with another one, rule number three. If this does not help, we change the sketch to an example sketch of the display library, rule number three for the code. We only continue if we see the message on the display, rule number six. Now we know that our WeMOS and our display work and we can connect the temperature sensor. If the OLED displays the temperature, everything is okay. If not, we look at serial if it lists a temperature reading. Maybe we have to add a few lines of code to display it. If the temperature shows zero or if the code blocks, we apply rule number three and number seven to the sensor. Check the connections and change the sensor. Let's assume we found the error and the temperature displays. Then we have solved our problem and we are happy. So let's summarize the rules. Number one, ask if it already worked once maybe also somewhere else. Rule number two, separate components to reduce complexity. Rule number three, exchange components, hardware or software. Rule number four, always buy two or more parts if they are affordable to have another one to exchange. Rule number five, reduce the number of possible interactions, like Indiana Jones. Rule number six, only continue if all components tested so far work. And rule number seven, never assume something is right before you checked it twice. But bad luck here, we see that the temperature shows 26 degrees, but we know that it is definitely wrong. Now we are back to rule number one and the answer to our question is, no, it never showed an accurate temperature. And we are in case B now. Of course, we always enter case B if we want to build something new, because case B is for inventors or makers, not for repairmen. I remember an old saying of the Swiss air pilots, 
when the company still existed. Fly with the eagles or scratch with the chickens. But they knew that flying high also meant falling deep, as we makers who do not want to buy all stuff in shops. What are the weapons for inventors? The first weapon is Google, which means find somebody who solved this or a similar problem already. Why that? As we saw in our tuning example, sometimes we have chances to change a massive case B problem into a more straightforward case A problem. Maybe we find a working solution and we just have to implement it. And if we encounter problems, we can use all the rules from the repairman. The second weapon for the inventor is experimenting and measuring. And the third is creativity. If we would, for example, find out that the sensor is always one degree wrong, we only could add a calibration step and save the money for a more expensive sensor. I do not want to dig deeper in this area. I think you got the point. One thing, however, is essential. Also, inventors are advised to use our rules as much as possible. Of course, without rule number one. This question is already answered. If you are interested in a real life example, you can have a look at the link in the description. There you can find a discussion on how to solve the issue of intermittent false triggers of a radar sensor in conjunction with an ESP8266. Check for yourself if this is a case A or B, name the different components and decide where you would start the debugging process and in which order you would proceed. How would you restrict the interactions between components? Comments and discussions are welcome. I hope this unusual video was useful or at least interesting for you. If true, please consider supporting the channel to secure its future existence. If not true and you did not like it, please leave a comment with your thoughts. Thank you. Bye.